In this episode of Ricky's Historical Tidbits, I will share with you the story of a man who made his mark wherever he went, whether it was mining for gold, building a telegraph line across the country, constructing railroads, potentially investing the Pony Express, and most notably, consul for the Chinese people in the United States. What was his name? Frederick A. B. This is Ricky's Historical Tidbits Podcast, and this is Ricky Mortensen. The year was 1825. John Quincy Adams is the president. The Kansas tribe gave up their land that would go on to be known as the state of Kansas, and the Erie Canal opened and Frederick Alonzo B. was born. Frederick's parents were English immigrants to the New World, encouraging their children to do great things in the wonderful new place called America. This would come into play when Frederick is about 23 years old, when news from the West came that this place, known as California, was covered in gold. And soon, men, young and old, raced to California to make it rich. Frederick's older brother, Albert, left for California first, arriving in San Francisco in June, and then Frederick showed up in September. Albert wrote a diary of his trip, which is a really interesting read, and if you have the time, it's long, but if you have the time, check it out. Link is in the description. In the B Brothers' time in Placerville, they were mostly just miners, Albert being the more successful one, but even still, Frederick had an operation when he employed about 20 Chinese men to work. Albert and Frederick ran a store together over in Placerville, a basic grocery store you can see here in the picture. They sold all kinds of things, butter, food, tools, and even ice. Frederick also experimented with growing hops, which, if you didn't know, is used to make beer. By the end of the 1850s, Frederick had begun a new career in the telegraph business. Telegraphs were the future, and Frederick's goal in the long term was to be able to send a message all the way from one side to the other side of the country. But even then, telegraphs didn't even go from California to Nevada. The goal was to start a telegraph line in Placerville and then have it go over the Sierra Nevada mountains into Carson City and then up over to Salt Lake City. This was about the same time, by the way, that Snowshoe Thompson had started his mail route. Check that episode out if you haven't already. Within a few years, not only had the telegraph line been built from Placerville to Salt Lake City, but all the way to the eastern states where the first transcontinental telegraph was sent to Abraham Lincoln from the state of California in 1861. The next day, Albert B., Frederick's brother, sent his own transcontinental telegraph, saying, The Pacific Telegraph calls the Atlantic Cable. The person on the receiving end then replied, Your message received, but the Atlantic cable is not dead, but sleepeth. In due time, it will answer the call of the Pacific Telegraph. Also, I mentioned it in the very beginning, but it's worth mentioning again, that Frederick was listed among a bunch of other names behind something called the Central Overland California and Pikes Peak Express Company, which was the parent company of the Pony Express. And what's really interesting about that is the telegraph replaced the Pony Express. Once the task of the telegraph was done, Frederick moved on once again to another career, the railroad. For the next decade or so, Frederick would invest in multiple rail lines, continuing to move up in the world while the Civil War was being fought. His railroad days ended when he had to sue the San Francisco and Humboldt Bay Railroad. From there, he worked on trying to get a mail route to Australia, and that didn't work out. And He did some stuff in Samoa, which seems to have been part of the Australia mail route, which failed. In 1878, Frederick's new and last career in advocating for the Chinese in America came to be, and so he became consul for China. As consul, Frederick investigated instances of immigration, deportation, working conditions, and murders of the Chinese people in America. He would then go to Congress and advocate on behalf of the Chinese people in the midst of the Chinese Exclusion Act, going on to saying in front of Congress, I believe that the immortal truths of the Declaration of Independence came from the same source with the Golden Rule and the Sermon on the Mount. As surely as the path 
which our fathers entered a hundred years ago, led to safety, to strength, to glory. So surely the path on which we now propose to enter brings us to shame, to weakness, and to peril. Proving himself to be an honorable man, the Chinese emperor appointed him the Mandarin of the Blue Button, which is a high honor, and this is what the Blue Button looks like. There are five orders of nobility in China, similar to the European ones like Duke, Marquis, Earl, Viscount, and Baron, and the Blue Button is closest to a Viscount. Over the years, Chinese Americans were often attacked and murdered, and there had been plenty of massacres of them as well. Some of the most famous examples of anti-Chinese riots or massacres are the Rock Springs Massacre in Wyoming, 1885, where the coal miners were going on a strike, but the Chinese workers refused to go on strike, so the striking coal miners killed 28 Chinese men and then rioted into their little Chinatown, burning about 78 homes. Then there was the Seattle riots of 1886. Uh, it wasn't as deadly, but the people of Seattle chased the Chinese out of town onto the docks to herd them onto a ship and told them to go back to China. And there was also the Hell's Canyon massacre of 1887 over in Oregon, where 34 Chinese miners got ambushed and then killed. Here is a picture of Frederick during the investigation of the Rock Springs massacre. Frederick never stopped working on behalf of the Chinese, and though he never saw the end of the anti-Chinese movement, he is honored today all around the country, having B Street named after him over in Sausalito, and also being one of the miners featured in the Miners on Main scavenger hunt down on Main Street in Placerville. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day. You've been listening to Ricky's Historical Tidbits Podcast. When you go to school and study history, they give you dates, they give you some names, and that's about it. But there's a lot more to California history, and that's where this show comes in. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from the show, and we hope you were entertained. And we'll be back soon, but in the meantime, hook up with us on Twitter and Instagram at busy underscore Ricky. Find us on Facebook at Ricky's Historical Tidbits. Till next time, this is Ricky's Historical Tidbits Podcast, signing off.